All right. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, we're just letting some more people get in, but I'll do a little intro here. This is the talk about processing big changes, grief and loss during COVID-19. Uh, this is with Mental Health America in collaboration with Mentally Fit. I'm Dan Pierce. I'm one of the founders of Mentally Fit. I'm also joined by, or we are also joined by Bianca B, who is my co-founder at Mentally Fit. And we're super excited to get into the talk today. <laughs> so um, could you let us know in the chat where you are um, joining us from, what city you're in? We are in Los Angeles, California. And I'd love to know where you're from, where you're joining us from. So let us know in the chat. Carly says Albuquerque. Michael says Winona, Minnesota. It's coming in real fast here, but I see Baltimore, Vancouver, Columbus, Indiana. Awesome, I love it. So many awesome places, Sacramento. Yeah. Beautiful. And then, yeah, Emily, you can go ahead with the- yeah, Well, people are putting uh, your location in there. Some notes before I introduce our presenters. We are recording this webinar and the recording and slides will be sent out to all registrants within the next week. We'll also be able to find them archived on MHA's website at mhanational.org slash webinars. We don't offer CDUs, but if you'd like a certificate of attendance, we do have a form for you to request one. I'll post the link to that form in the chat shortly and it'll be included in the follow-up email as well. And last but not least, we have built in time for Q&A at the end. So please post your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. We'll go through some of those at the end and feel free to make comments or share some of your knowledge in there as well. And happy Wednesday. Welcome everyone. Today's webinar is Processing Big Changes, Grief and Loss During COVID-19. I'm so excited to have our presenters with us today, Dan Pierce and Bianca B. Dan and Bianca are the founders of Mentally Fit, like Dan just said. They started the company due to their own experiences with mental health growing up and wanting others like themselves to have more access to support and resources and education. I'll let them introduce themselves and more about their company, um, but they founded Mentally Fit as part of a mission to bridge the gap in mental health, making it affordable, accessible, and relatable for people worldwide. I know they have a ton of great information to share with you all today, so I will turn it over to Dan and Bianca to take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Emily. Um, and thank you everybody who's tuning in. I'm still looking at the chat and everybody who's coming in from all these different states and cities. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So just reiterating what Emily just said, um, we Dan and I founded Mentally Fit and our mission is to make mental health more accessible, affordable, and relatable. There are so many evidence-based modalities and everyday skills that we can use to take care of our mental health. And that's why our number one goal with Mentally Fit is to share access to mental health education and resources. Because the reality is, you are never truly alone in what you go through. Someone else feels the way you feel. Someone else has felt the way you have felt. And there are incredible psychologists, researchers, and information out there that can help you. But a lot of us have felt alone, haven't we? Growing up, I always felt alone. I always felt like no one understood my pain, no one understood my anger. And for the longest time, I didn't even know what trauma was. I didn't know what mental health really was, aside from what I saw in scary movies about psych wards. My co-founder, Dan, grew up feeling like he was on fire his entire life until he found the modality that worked best for him to manage his emotions and to be present. So you are not alone in whatever it is that you're going through, and you're especially not alone in what we all lived through as a global community in this past year. During 2020, I, I hit rock bottom with my mental health. It was incredibly hard to process everything that was going on. Processing big life changes are hard. In fact, when change happens, it actually activates the conflict sensors in our brain, which causes brain chaos, which in psychology, this is called cognitive dissonance. So it's normal to have a hard time with change. Did anyone else struggle with all the changes this past year? grieving loss of a loved one, loss of work, loss of lifestyle. Let's talk about it in the chat. Feel free to share as much or as little as you'd like. I know for me, 
I felt like I lost all of my self-care tools, no access to the gym or other amenities that helped me de-stress and connect with my body. Um, I'm, I'm a super social creature as most of us are. So it was incredibly hard for me to not be able to hang out with big groups of people, exchange positive energies with strangers. I mean, we all lost the social aspect of our lives, right? What about you, Dan? Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, definitely the gym and all those like little self-care things that are easy to take for granted, being around other people, um, all those things that were kind of supports uh, in my life and it sounds like in your life and in many other people's lives were just ripped away out of nowhere. So um, in addition to those, I also um, unfortunately lost a, a good friend of mine who was kind of pushed over the edge by the pandemic um, in his addiction and he overdosed and he died. Um, so that was probably the hardest loss um, of last year. I know a lot of people out there have lost somebody, a loved one, um, either to sickness or addiction. Um, and my heart goes out to you if that's you out there. It's really hard. Um, so I know a lot of people that have lost people, they've lost normalcy. There's just so many different ways that we've all experienced loss. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, the solution moving forward, right? So we've all experienced this grief and this loss. We're, we're maybe in the middle of it right now. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that and know that it's okay to be where you are right now in that process because grief, as we know, is a process that we go through. There's stages of it. You can look it up on Google, um, the, the stages of grief. And once we um, are past processing or we're in the middle of processing and we wanna start moving forward, where do we start? So the first step would be to maintain self-care practice. And number one is meet yourself where you're at. That just means that no matter where you're at right now in your self-care, uh, whether you're on top of every little habit or you've just completely lost control, um, you're at the right place, right? You're at the right place to start for you. So without judgment, um, just know that you're at the right place and that you can start wherever you're at. And number two is to start with one key habit. When you start with one key habit, um, you know, a lot of times we feel like when it comes to self-care, we need to conquer the whole world. We have to do all the things, start eating healthier, working out every day for an hour or more, like all these different things. And that can start to feel um, like a lot, right? And it can deter us and prevent us from making the changes that we want to make. So we start with one key habit. Um, an example of that might be drinking a cup of water when you wake up in the morning. Um, it might be meditating at some point throughout your day or taking a walk in the morning. I would actually love to know um, from everyone in the chat, what is one key habit that you either recommend that others do, that you love, that you do yourself, or one that you'd like to pick up? Uh, let us know a key habit that you love. Uh, Michael says exercise, love that. Sarah says journaling, exercise, breathing exercises, gym in the morning, playing with dogs, love playing with dogs. That is a great um, self-care activity. Um, yeah, so there's so many different things and just building one key habit into your daily routine is a great place to start. Um, and third is set daily reminders. You can set an alarm in your phone that says it's time to go for a walk. I think, you know, it sounds small, but that one walk a day with, with your alarm can make a big difference. And as you continue stacking new uh, self-care habits, it's going to continue to amplify the effects. Loving all the, the key habits in the chat. Driving is my virtue, love that. So the next thing that I definitely want to talk about just in the process of processing big changes and grief and loss is checking in with yourself. Checking in with yourself is so important, especially when you are grieving a loss and processing big life changes. You are in charge of you. The same way you are taking care of your family, your friends, your loved ones, the same way you're taking care of your work responsibilities and your home, you need to show yourself that same level of care and consideration. These are some of the ways that Dan and I check in with ourselves on a daily basis. So one, set daily reminders, just like Dan was just talking about um, with habit stacking and creating a balance. 
I have reminders to eat because I don't know if any one of you guys can relate, but I get so wrapped up in my work that an entire day can go by without me eating a single meal if I don't check in with myself. I know that this can definitely be the case when you're grieving as well. Um, so that's a simple reminder that I have, you know, 9.30 a.m., did you eat breakfast? 12, did you eat lunch? And I just remind myself to get up and go eat and nourish my body and take care of myself. Please let me know in the chat if anyone else um, is like this where you literally have to remind yourself to eat. Um, and like Dan mentioned, I have reminders to drink water, to go for a walk, to breathe and take a moment to be mindful. Setting reminders to check in with yourself sets you up for success. Number two is listen to your body. Now, listen to your body can sometimes be easier said than done. A lot of times can be easier said than done. But in all seriousness, your body is going to tell you basic things throughout the day, like I'm hungry, I'm tired, I need a break from looking at the screen. And you need to listen to your body. If you are going to be as productive as you can be, if you're going to be happy, you need to take care of yourself. I don't care how busy your day gets, take a break, have lunch, take a break, go for a walk. And as I'm telling you this, I'm reminding myself as well every day to make sure that I listen to my body and take care of myself. Um, working from home is a big change that a lot of us had to adjust to this past year. Let me know in the chat if, if you had to work from home. I already see from Jamie, um, that you've been working from home, eating too much. I, I definitely, I definitely get that. Um, but yeah, working from home was a big change. A lot of us had to adjust to this past year and that can so easily turn into sitting on your laptop the entire day without moving, not going outside for fresh air. We don't want that. So what is your favorite thing to do when you take a break? When you take a break from work, when you want to just be mindful. What are some activities that you like to do? Do you like to go on a walk? Let's let me know in the chat. Play my guitar. I love that. Drink tea, drink coffee. Yes, going for a walk is amazing. Dogs, I so wish I had a dog. You have no idea how bad I wish I could have a dog so I can just have dog therapy every day. Binge watch Netflix. Yes, I definitely binge watching Netflix. <laughs> I love, you know, there's a limit, but I love being able to do that and just forget about all the the perils and the stresses of the day and just watch TV, write poetry. The other thing, which I saw you guys mention in the chat was journaling as a key habit that you guys like to do. Journaling is such an amazing tool. It's a great way to talk to yourself. I've used it for as long as I can remember to write out how I'm feeling. And I'm often surprised as to what comes up. You can, you can surprise yourself when you're journaling. You can get to know yourself while journaling. You can help yourself process big changes and grief and loss while journaling. So that is definitely a tool that I recommend. I know I already saw some people write earlier in the chat that they journal, but if you journal, please let me know in the chat. Just say yes if you journal. I want to see how many other folks are, are doing this practice. And if you're not doing it already, I 100% recommend to start. It doesn't have to be a one, three, one essay. You can literally write two to three sentences and just talk to yourself, you know, connect with yourself. So the next thing that's so important when processing big changes and dealing with grief and loss is to focus on what you can control. When the world as you know it and life is changing all around you, it's important to focus on what you can control. It's simply not helpful to ruminate over things you can't control. So what can we control in situations like this? So one, you can take control over how you react and respond to what's happening. One way to do this is by using a skill called radical acceptance. It's actually a DBT skill, um, dialectical behavior therapy. But radical acceptance is a distress tolerance tool that helps us accept reality and stop responding with impulsive or destructive behaviors. When we first went into lockdown here in LA, I was pretty upset about all the shutdowns. I was 
upset about having to stay away from my friends and I did spend some time obsessing over being upset. Um, I can admit that sometimes I do let myself wallow in my own misery, but that's not really helpful, is it? Um, once I took control over how I was reacting to what was happening, that's when I was really able to start the grieving and healing process. Um, I see Deanna in the chat. Yes, I try to live by that mantra, focus on what I can control. Yes, it is such an amazing tool to just focus on what you can control and accept the things that you can't control. Number two is to acknowledge and tune in to the good. During a worldwide pandemic, it is so easy to get sucked into focusing on all the bad. There's so much going on around the world. This past year, I started following so many news outlets and pages. Prior to the pandemic, I didn't really at all. Um, but of course, during the pandemic, I wanted to stay updated on lockdown restrictions and all sorts of pandemic news, which turned into politic news and so on and so forth. It's exhausting. Um, and it's so important to take a break from thinking about the bad and tune into the good, acknowledge the good. Because the truth is every day may not be good, but there is good in every day. So it's important to remind yourself of that. One way I like to remind myself of the good is by practicing gratitude. You can pause at any moment of the day and say three good things that you are grateful for. Let's do that now. Tell me in the chat, what are three good things that you can be grateful for today? And I'll go first. One, my birthday is in two days. And so far this week has been filled with love. Number two, one of my best friends flew to LA to visit me. Also part of the reason why this week has been filled with love. And three, my community is growing every day and I'm always grateful for new members joining my community. So Dan, what are three good things happening for you right now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, number one is your birthday. I think that's very exciting. Um, <laughs> Got to give a shout out to your B-Day week being this week. Um, number two is uh, it's the sun is shining out here in L.A., um, which is really nice. People are happy. And number three is um, I feel like this one's always on my gratitude list, but coffee. I had a really good coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. I see everyone in the chat. Beautiful weather, dogs, thank you for the happy birthday wish, health. Yes, yes, a wonderful team, coffee, <laughs> your husband, your cat. I love it. I love, 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 love gratitude. It is probably one of the most powerful tools for your mental health. The simplest and most powerful tool for your mental health is to practice gratitude. Yeah. Um, one thing you can do if you're looking for a small habit and an alarm to add, one alarm that I have that I love is at eight o'clock every evening, it sets an alarm that asks, what are three things that you're grateful for today? And I find that that is a great way to keep my mind aligned with gratitude. Yes, yes, yes. I love that practice. And I'm loving seeing everything that you guys are grateful for in the chat. Please keep it coming. I love it. So number three is make plans that you can look forward to. This is another thing that you can control. It's okay if you aren't a super organized person, but when you're processing big changes, it can be helpful to focus on planning. You don't have to stick to your plan perfectly or get too wrapped up in the little details of it, but just starting small with what your day is gonna look like, what your week is gonna look like, can help you get rid of all of the feelings of uncertainty that come with change. That's really what makes it really hard is, is all of the uncertainty. So just coming up with some plans that you can look forward to can be really, really helpful. I'm a big planner. Anybody who knows me knows this. I love planning stuff. It just makes me so happy. I always have some sort of, I always have to have some sort of plan for my day or my week because otherwise I am a ball of anxiety. So that's, that's just me. I have to make plans for things and I have to have stuff to look forward to throughout the day, whether that's a lunch break or my walks or my gym time, but I need to make plans for things that I can look forward to. Um, it's really helpful and I definitely encourage you try it, especially when coping with grief and loss. 
it can be so simple. Your plan to walk around your favorite park. We have a turtle pond um, near our house. And sometimes that's just a small plan. In the morning, I'm gonna walk to the turtle pond and I'm gonna just look at the turtles. That's a simple thing that I can control. I can control the fact that I can go walk to the, the turtle pond and have a moment, a mindful moment with the turtles. So that's a really, really good tool and a good way to focus on what you can control and just give you something to look forward to, especially when everything feels like it's bad or there's a lot of changes or you're grieving and you're not feeling well. That's a really good way to just, you know, bring some enjoyment into your life, plan something that you enjoy. Thank you again for the birthday wishes and just checking the chat really quick. Um, we can share the PowerPoint slides. I will share them with Emily um, and I'm sure that she can um, put them somewhere or send it out to you guys. Okay, so the next thing that's so important is connecting with community. Community is so vital. Mentally Fit is all about community. The heart of everything we do is our community. We have about 100,000 members all over the world that come together to support each other in mental health. Um, because we need to support each other. Humans need support from other humans. And nowadays there's a community for everything. So I encourage you to find community that you can connect with. It can be based on shared mission, shared value, shared experiences, shared passions. Just find community. Um, through community, you can also find an accountability partner. I like to have a self-care accountability partner. One of the ways that I committed to taking care of myself during the pandemic and just the work from home life is to put some makeup on every day and actually get ready and get dressed for the day. Because I know that I feel good if I look good and if I don't just stay in my pajamas all day. Um, so that's just a way, a self-care tool that I use. And so my best friend and I, had to send each other a selfie by noon every day to hold each other accountable um, and just stay on track with actually getting up and getting dressed and putting some makeup on and fixing my hair for the day so that I feel better every day. It's working from home adjustment. That was super helpful for me. Some days I would do work pajamas, Lisa. Um, but the most important thing was to just not just roll out of the bed and just work and not do anything to care for myself. My time in the morning to get ready was my time where I brush my hair, I put on makeup, you know, just girly things to get myself happy and ready for the day. So finding an accountability partner is super helpful, even with something so simple as just being accountable with our self-care. Um, when it comes to processing big changes, we all need help. It's not easy and it's totally okay and normal for you to have a hard time processing big life changes. So we can help each other out. Are you connected and involved in a community already? Have you been tapping into your community during the pandemic? Let us know in the chat. Are you connected with a community right now that you can tap into when you need someone to talk to, when you need support? Let me know in the chat. I really hope the answer is yes. Um, but for anybody who doesn't have a community, obviously we would love to extend an invitation for you to join the Mentally Fit community. We have been there for each other through this pandemic, helping each other out and supporting each other, sharing resources, mental health education. And of course, Mental Health America is such an amazing, amazing, incredible resource. I'm sure there's community here as well. Yes, church, your therapist, your provider on better health, that's awesome. Family. Fitness, uh, fitness communities are amazing, amazing, definitely a game changer. Siblings, I love that. That's awesome. My strength, great. Yes, I always, always, always recommend to be connected with community. Like I mentioned, it's life is hard and we need to help each other out. We need to support each other whether we're processing big changes, dealing with grief and loss, just everyday life challenges, it's so helpful to be connected to a community. So I'm really happy to hear that you guys have some community that you can tap into, whether that's coworkers, 
friends, church, different other niche communities, mothers of lost children. That's an example of a niche community that can be specific to something that you are dealing with and you can connect with like people who are dealing with the same thing. That's so helpful. Outdoor activities with surfing, running, Again, fitness communities are so incredible. It's so good to connect with people around fitness and exercise and doing healthy activities. Love that. Yeah, so at this point, I know that we have a Q&A that we're going to be doing. So if you have any questions, please submit them into the Q&A because we will be answering those questions shortly. Um, so please let us know if you have any questions about anything that we talked about in the presentation from self-care practices, the, the key habits, checking in with yourself, focusing on what you can control, making plans, connecting with community. If there's anything we talked about in the presentation where you have a question, please let us know and we are going to open up the Q&A in just a moment here. Yeah, um, and also one more thing, uh, as Bianca mentioned, if you do want to join us in the Mentally Fit community, uh, we've got tons of resources. We bring in experts to give talks and panels. Um, we have people offering each other peer support and resources, and we'd love to have you join us. Uh, you can visit us and join the community at joinmentallyfit.com. Uh, you can also email us at hello at joinmentallyfit.com with any questions. Um, I saw somebody had mentioned they have some research they wanted to share. So yeah, anything you want to share, any conversations you want to start, uh, we would love to hear from you. So please send us an email, join the community, and we'd love to um, know you and get to know you better. Yeah, and I also just wanted to, I just saw in the chat, Diana mentioned, I think it can be challenged, challenging to connect when feeling down, that's very true. The hardest part is just taking that step to connect with other people. But I promise you that once you get over that hump, it's so worth it. It helps so much just to connect with other people and let them know how you're feeling and just talk to somebody. But one step that you can take before that is just talk with yourself. Like I mentioned, journaling as a tool is super, super helpful. So just maybe even gathering your thoughts and how you feel by journaling as a first step before talking to other members of your community about how you're feeling, that can also help. Thank you both so much for so many great tips and tricks. Um, yes, yeah, so we have plenty of time for Q and A. Uh, we already have a bunch of questions, but continue to ask them in the chat. Um, starting with a common response to being overwhelmed with change is freezing up and feeling kind of paralyzed. What's a good first step to get out of that? B, do you want to take this one? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I definitely identify with this. I for sure freeze up. Um, that's one of those responses, right? Fight, flight, freeze. Um, I think that with freezing, the simplest thing that you can do is breathe. Just breathe and get in touch with your body. Um, take deep breaths in and out um, and give yourself time. You know, just give yourself time to just be mindful, sit with your feelings and just breathe. And then after that, I would recommend, again, the journaling as a tool. Um, journaling and just connecting with, with how you feel and talking to yourself. one that's very relevant to COVID times. How do you deal with change when there's so much uncertainty and you can't prepare for what the newness will look like? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty much what we all went through this past year, right? <laughs> um, I would go back to the focusing on what you can control because at the end of the day with the pandemic especially, there's literally we couldn't control what the next lockdown restrictions were gonna be. We couldn't control when things were gonna open back up, when a vaccine was gonna be available. There's so many variables that were coming up every day, every week that we wouldn't be able to control. But what we can control is just in our bubble, in our homes, right? You can control 
going for a walk and making a plan for that. You can control your self-care practices that you can do at home. So again, just really, really focusing on what you can control. And again, referring back to that radical acceptance skill that I talked about, it's super important to accept reality because with the pandemic especially, it, it is what it was. There's nothing that we could have done. Nobody could have snapped their fingers and been like, pandemic over. All right, we're good. Let's, let's go party. <laughs> you couldn't do that, right? You had to accept that this was happening. You had to accept that there was a worldwide pandemic and that you didn't know when it was going to be over. And once you accept that, then you can focus on the things that you can control and, and focus on your self-care and make sure that you are taking care of yourself transition to the next question. Um, a lot of people have questions about radical acceptance and more about what that is and how do you practice that in real life? Yeah, radical accept acceptance is exactly what it sounds like. It's radically accepting what is happening in that moment, whether that is with grief, if you lost a loved one. At some point you have to accept what is happening because you can't change it, right? So that's again, going back to things that you can't change. You have to accept what is happening. And from there, that is when you can truly start to process and heal and, and go through those, the, the process of grieving. So radical acceptance, put simply, is accepting reality, accepting what is happening so that you can move on to the next stage of healing, of grieving, and processing. Yeah, I think there's a good uh, quote that uh, could go along with that. Um, it's been attributed to uh, the Dalai Lama, but not 100% sure it's him, but it's a great quote nonetheless. And it's that pain is inevitable and suffering is optional. So uh, we're gonna go through pain in life, painful things are going to happen, uh, but the more that we can accept that we're in those situations and just kind of um, reduce the re resistance to the pain, that will relieve our suffering from the pain. Great, and a bunch of people asking about emotion regulation and distress tolerance. Could you explain what those are and what the difference between them is and how, how you can use those in real life as well? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, I use emotion regulation and distress tolerance skills all the time. Um, I know them through the style of therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, but I'm sure they're in other styles of therapy as well. Um, and they're just a set of skills for, you know, as it's, you know, it says in the name, um, managing your emotions and managing uh, situations that are very, very challenging emotionally. Um, so I don't want to get too much into like how to practice it because uh, I'm not a therapist, but definitely join our community. There's a lot of people talking about distress tolerance um, and emotion regulation skills in there. And you can ask all the questions you'd like. Uh, there's lots of therapists in there that teach dial dialectical behavior therapy skills. So um, if you want to learn more about that, uh, visit joinmentallyfit.com. But I highly, highly recommend it for everyone um, to learn at least a little bit about those types of skills because they're very valuable for just every aspect of your life, of our lives. Great, and going back to radical acceptance a little bit, how do you overcome that denial? Yeah, it, it's, it's a process. Like I'm not going to pretend that it's easy, um, especially depending on the magnitude of whatever it is that you need to accept, um, especially with grief and, and losing a loved one. Um, I think it's, it's very important to just acknowledge what, how you're feeling about it. And then also acknowledge that you can't change it because I think that's really what gets us kind of stuck in that denial and, and kind of stuck in between that place of accepting and processing and going through those stages of grief, um, is because we aren't acknowledging that we can't change it. Right. There's still a tiny part of us that's hanging on and hoping that something's going to change. Somebody's going to come back or, or something, a miracle is going to happen. Um, but it's really important to accept that you can't change whatever the thing is, whether it's losing a loved one, losing normal normalcy from the pandemic, losing work, losing a job, 
um, you have to get to a point where you accept that you can't change it. And it can help to say that, say that, write it in your journaling. I know that I can't change this. I know that I have to accept this. I have to accept this pain. I have to accept this loss. If it's hard for you, if you're having a hard time getting past that, write it down, say it, meditate on it, and do those different types of tools to help you get past that, but also know that it's hard and there's no specific time limit on, on when you're, it's supposed to happen or how it's supposed to happen. It's gonna be different for everybody. The important thing is to keep trying and, and keep doing um, those steps and using the tools and resources out there um, to help you get through that. And again, just going back to community, Community is so important because sometimes it can be really hard for you to get over that hump and stay in, in denial or, or stay in the place of feeling, hoping that you can change something that you can't. Um, so talking to somebody else, whether that's community, a therapist, um, a friend that you really trust and love and you know that can be supportive to you, um, that can also help you with that process, talking to people. But it looks different for everybody. Some people you know, the harder part is talking to somebody. So maybe journaling might be easier for them or saying those mantras to themselves are easier. So everybody's different and everybody's process looks different. So acknowledge that it's, there's no one or right way to do it um, and use those resources and tools such as journaling, breathing, saying those mantras to yourself so that you can help yourself accept, accept, accept so that you can begin that processing. Yeah, one thing I would add to that is I see somebody, uh, Mark, uh, had mentioned in the chat that Dr. Alan Wolfelt's Six Needs of Mourning is a great resource, and I would definitely agree with that. Um, Dr. Alan Wolfelt from the Center for Loss um, and Life Transition is an amazing resource for anyone who's suffering uh, from uh, loss, specifically anyone who's lost someone uh, to death. Um, definitely check out their website which is centerforloss.com. And Dr. Alan Wolfelt, we had him on our podcast not too long ago, a great resource. So thank you for sharing that, Mark. Great. And switching gears a little bit, um, for people who are introverts or homebodies who may have really enjoyed staying home this last year, how can they deal with communities reopening and having more outside of the house obligations and the anxiety and fatigue that may come along with that? <laughs> I think I could take this one because um, I actually am more of a naturally introverted homebody type person, whereas B, uh, Bianca is more of the outgoing uh, life of the party, and um, which is great. You know, we, we find a good balance there. Um, and you know, what's weird is at the beginning of the pandemic, when everything shut down, I actually experienced like an instant um, relief of anxiety. It was kind of like everyone else was, was now feeling what I had always been feeling on the inside. Like everyone was, was anxious. So the external environment really matched my internal environment. Um, so I lost that, um, that fear of missing out, that FOMO. And now that things are opening back up, um, I think it's just a matter of re-engaging, you know, to the extent that you find comfortable. So um, definitely try something out, you know, go be around other humans. It can be hard first because, you know, we've lost, um, I, I can only speak for myself, but I know um, a lot of us have lost social skills or just that sharpened uh, sense of being able to talk eloquently, doing it right now, honestly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it can be hard. So I would say just engage in a way that feels like comfortable to you, safe to you is really important. Um, so if big crowds make you anxious, try to do something that's a little more, you know, low key. Um, there's so many different things happening. Like we've been to some networking events for like tech meetups. We've been to beach parties. Um, I prefer things that are outdoors just because there's more fresh air. Um, I don't love being around big crowds, but you know, I'll kind of go in and out. So all that to say, just for, sort of figure out what um, your comfort is in terms of your comfortability and safety and just test the waters. Yeah. And just to add to that, you can even start with the close circle of people that you, you trust and that you know that you love to be around. Maybe you miss them during this pandemic. Um, you know, you can do small things, have dinner together and just like slowly walk back into it. Cause even for me, I'm super outgoing and I was 
so excited for things to open back up. I'm like, I'm so ready. I want to go out. But I did lose some social skills and I was like, oh my God, how do I talk to people? <laughs> I'm like, this is awkward. Um, so just take it slow. There's no rush. Just because things open up, like I know in LA, things are opening up June 15th. It doesn't mean you have to go to parties now and you have to go to the bar. Like you don't have to do anything. You can take it slow and just meet yourself where you're at. What about when dealing with a group of people, like a group of friends? How do you balance different emotions regarding moving back to normalcy and how some people want to stay back home, aren't quite ready for it, and others who are ready to get back out there? Yeah, I would, one of the things that I would say with this is do what's best for you and don't feel guilty about it. Like you don't, even if your friends are pressuring you to go out or they want you to, to do things that you don't want to do, do what's best for you. Avoid saying yes to things that you don't want to do. Don't, don't do that. Just say no. It's not that big of a deal. It won't be the end of the world. And again, just slowly get back into it. Maybe you just want to hang out with one friend. Maybe there's just one particular friend that you haven't seen in the last year that you would love to hang out with. Maybe you guys can just go on a walk, you know? Make it super, super digestible and easy for you and don't get guilt tripped into anything. Say no. No, I can't go to your dinner party. No, I can't go to your birthday party. And you can navigate each type of person the way that's best for you. You know what I mean? Um, whether you're dealing with your friends who have really big personalities or the shyer ones, um, navigate them the best way you can and just the main thing that I want to stress is that you can say no. Great. And a really great comment in the chat from Rachel on that saying no is a complete sentence. Exactly. It's so important and it's so hard and it can feel so awkward, but it is just you not wanting to is enough. Totally valid. Exactly. I have the hardest time saying no. So trust me, it's, it's not easy, but once you do, you realize that it's not a big deal. It's, and it's also so much better to say no than to like, say yes and then back out later. Just, just say no from the beginning. You'll save yourself anxiety. You'll save yourself extra conversations that are not necessary. You just say no. Great. And we have a number of parents and teachers in here asking how adults can help kids with processing changes and coping. Yeah. I mean, I will say I'm not a parent, <laughs> but I have worked with kids um, in a number of different fashions as being a nanny and working at summer camps um, back in the day. And one thing that I always say with this is that kids are humans too, and they're experiencing a lot of the stuff that we're experiencing too. So don't be afraid to talk to them like an adult, obviously with simpler um, words, you know, but just let them know what is going on and allow them, give them the space to talk about how they feel about it as a human. They're just smaller humans, but they're still humans just like us, dealing with all of these changes, seeing all the things that are going on in the world, and they're a lot smarter than we think they are. So just have a, a normal human conversation with them and give them the space to talk about how they feel. And if it helps, Again, going back to resources, there are worksheets out there, there's games you can play, and maybe you guys can journal together too. If you're having a hard time having the conversation or you feel like you know, they're not expressing themselves enough or they're holding back, you can also journal together. You know your kid best, so you can come up with the activities that you know that are going to um, speak to them in the best way. So use those activities, play those games, and talk to them and know that they are smart and they know what's going on too. You know, they, they're experiencing all of this too. So, so treat them the way you would want to be treated and, and talk to um, if you were in their position. Great. And final question, I think, um, about boundaries. Kind of going back to people having different opinions about what they want to do, if they want to go out, if they want to stay in for a bit longer. How can you set those boundaries? Yeah, so I, I'll take this one because I literally just had this conversation with one of my best friends the other day because she is struggling with this between work coming back. She's in the 
um, entertainment industry. So a lot of movie awards and all this stuff is coming back. So she's getting a, a ton of a flood of more work and then a flood of personal friendship, like outings and things. And she's having a really hard time balancing it. And as far as boundaries, what I recommend and what I've done for myself too, is knowing what those are from the beginning. So if you're having a hard time with whether you feel like you don't want to go out yet or you're not ready yet, it's really important for you to understand what your boundaries are first. So just taking some time to say, okay, what is okay for me? Do I want it? Like how many people do I want to be? Like what's too much for me? Is 10 my limit? Is 10 the max amount of people that I want to be around at one time? What are those boundaries? Write them out. It's very similar to if you're in a relationship and you're setting those boundaries early on. What are the boundaries that I need in my relationship so that this is a safe environment for me? It's the same way with your social life and all of the changes that are happening right now. Take some time to sit with yourself and write down what are those boundaries? How many times a week are you okay with going out? How many people are you okay with being around? How many, uh, you know, what types of events are you okay with, with going to? Maybe you only want to do dinners. Maybe you don't want to do parties where people are dancing on the dance floor. Figure out what those boundaries are with yourself and, and, and be true to yourself and how you're feeling before you involve other folks. And then when those times come where people are, you know, maybe somebody invites you to a birthday party and you find out that there's going to be a hundred people there and they're all going to be on the dance floor. You already know that your boundary is you're only hanging out with 10 people at a time. So that's an easy no for you. You don't have to go back and forth with it. So it's really important to just set your boundaries and know what they are so that you can have a better time sticking to them. If you don't know what your boundaries are, how can you stick to them? So figure out what those boundaries are for you. And then you'll have that reference point so that when people reach out to you and they're inviting you to stuff and they're asking you to do stuff and they're trying to guilt trip you into stuff, you know what your boundaries are. You can refer back to those boundaries, whether that's a list, however you want to organize it, you can refer back to those boundaries and you'll have your answer, whether or not you're going or not, or whatever it is that you're deciding to do. Great, and it looks like we've gotten to all the questions, so we'll wrap there. Thank you so much, Dan and Bianca, for sharing such valuable suggestions. Um, we'll be in touch with everyone in the next few days to get you the recording and the slides and that link to request your certificate of attendance. And make sure to check out Mentally Fit. They have their URL and that email up on the screen right now. Um, thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, thank you so much for having us. And enjoy your Memorial Weekend, everyone. <laughs> thanks, everyone.